Good, let's uh, carry on a little bit with the, um, the Anapanasati Sutta. So uh, this is the uh, idea of uh, uh, the body contemplation uh, in the Anapanasati Sutta, just the following the breath. And now we're going to move on to the Vedana Anupasa, the contemplation of feeling, which is, so the next four steps are equivalent to the contemplation of feelings in the Satipatthana Sutta. So I will uh, uh, read through them first of all, and then we will uh, um, consider them in a little bit of detail afterwards. Uh, and uh, so here we go. The practice like this, uh, I will breathe in experiencing rapture. Uh, the practice like this, I will breathe out experiencing rapture. Yeah, so we're talking about joy, the joy on the past, so and now we're getting starting to come to the joy, the rapture and the bliss and all these kind of things. Uh, the practice like this, I will breathe in experiencing bliss. Uh, the practice like this, I will breathe out experiencing bliss. Uh, rapture uh, and then bliss. The practice like this, I will breathe in experiencing mental processes. Uh, I will practice like this, I will breathe out experiencing mental processes. Uh, the practice like this, I will breathe in stilling the mental processes. Uh, the practice like this, I will breathe out, stilling the mental processes. So this is the Vedana Nupasana, the contemplation of feelings. Yeah? And uh, so, uh, uh, one of the, so what happens here is that you go from the stilling of the physical process, the stilling of the breath is the last one, the fourth part of the body contemplation, uh, and that then moves on quite seam seamlessly to the idea of contemplating rapture. Yeah? I will breathe in experiencing rapture. Yeah? And the rapture here, the Pali word is piti, and these are like the kind of the happy or the blissful or the um, uh, kind of uh, feelings often of the body and the mind. Yeah? You can often feel very strong, kind of almost like currents and things going through the body. Yeah? And uh, this is kind of rapture. It's a kind of a high level of gladness, a high level of joy. Yeah? or we can call it joy if you like. Yeah. But rapture is quite uh, descriptive of what is going on. Uh, and this can be experienced in different ways, uh, like there can be uh, showers of bliss going through the body, or there can be more like bolts of things, or there can be more a steady feeling, depending a bit on the personality and the strength of these kind of things. Uh, but it's basically a very, a very pleasant feeling uh, in the body and also the mind, uh, yeah? coming at the same time. Uh, this is the idea of rapture. It is described in detail, again, in the Vasudhi Magga. So, so uh, how does this happen? It happens as an automatic process very often. Yeah, you are, when the breath becomes very peaceful, it becomes very delightful. Uh, you're enjoying the peace. Uh, you are delighting in the whole experience. Uh, and then that fact that you are delighting in what is going on uh, then often turns into the feeling of rapture, strong kind of currents yeah, in the body that are very, very, very pleasant and very agreeable. Uh, and this is where you're starting to kind of move away from the ordinary world and moving on to the spiritual path of existence. Yeah, these are spiritual happiness, as you're seeing now. This is called Niramisa Sukha, the happiness which is beyond outside of the ordinary physical world. So now you're really on the spiritual path, in a sense, in a very powerful way. These are happinesses outside of ordinary happinesses in the world. So how do we make that... Transition from just watching the breath to experiencing rapture. Yeah. yeah, sounds like a good idea, doesn't it, to make that transition? Yeah, you can have some more happiness and joy. So how do we make that happen? And one way to make it happen is simply to carry on watching the breath in a peaceful way. And very often it just happens automatically. You start feeling more and more bliss, more and more happiness, because that is a natural consequence of enjoying what you're doing. Sometimes what you need to do is to nudge the mind a little bit. Uh, yeah? I mentioned before during the meditation the idea of bringing up gladness in various ways. Uh, and sometimes you just need to nudge the mind a little bit and just remind yourself of something from the past. Uh, yeah? Remind yourself of an action that you have done, so how you're living your life. This is called the Sila Nusati and Chaga Nusati, the very simple recollection. Uh, and sometimes all it is is not really thinking very much. Uh, it's just a reminder that I live well and just feeling a sense of gladness because you're living well. Or huh? just sending a bit of reminding yourself that you are together with a good group of people. How fortunate you are to be part of the BGS. Huh? 
how fortunate we are that the Dhamma is still in the world. Wow, that is really fortunate. The Dhamma is still here. And immediately that can make that peaceful meditation become more rapturous because you remember of the fortune, good fortune you have to be in the presence of the teachings of the Buddha. And very often a little nudging of the mind, just the bringing that perception uh, up that actually, you know, of these positive qualities can be enough to shift uh, the experience. Uh, but very gentle because the mind is already getting quite sensitive because it is very peaceful at this particular point. Uh, and then the rapture comes. Uh, and I will go into a great more detail about this, how to bring this about uh, as we continue this course. I'm not sure when it comes up, maybe tomorrow or something or the day after, whatever, see what happens. Uh, um, how to do this more specifically, especially how to think about the Buddha, how to think about uh, uh, one's um, life well lived and these kinds of things. So, so uh, this was, we're going to look at this in much more detail uh, but actually, it's quite simple. And for many people, because you're living well already, and because you know that you are living well, uh, when the breath becomes peaceful, you do feel joy. Uh, yeah? You do feel happiness. Uh, you do feel a sense of uplift. Uh, and it kind of just happens as a matter of course, which is, uh, which is nice. Uh, so then what? Uh, once you're feeling rapture, uh, is that enough? It is not enough. Uh, yeah? Then we have to carry on. Uh, and feeling rapture is uh, just the beginning of this amazing path uh, Bliss upon bliss upon bliss. That is Ajahn Brahm's coinage uh, yeah, of uh, what happens on the path. Uh, so that's kind of his idea. So Ajahn Ganaha, he says, breathe in, sabai, breathe out, sabai. Uh, Ajahn Brahm says, bliss upon bliss upon bliss. These are two alternative ways of describing the same kind of process. Uh, you know sabai, the word sabai? Uh, it means like chillax, uh, the English translation, chillax. Uh, yeah? So uh, breathe in, chillax, breathe out, chillax. Uh, ch chillax means... Uh, is a, is, a, is a mixture of chilling and relaxing, yeah? So chillaxing, yeah? yeah? <laughs> so chillax. Be satisfied, yeah? Yeah, to be satisfied, to relax, to enjoy, all of these kind of things. Yeah? It has kind of this broad, broad meaning. Yeah? That was his, you know, that, you know that story, Billy, when they went from, you know that story when they went from Perth to visit Ajahn Ganha? I think I told, did I tell this before? Huh? I think I told it before. Yeah. They all went to uh, Thailand, this whole group of people from Perth. Yeah, I thought I said it before. Anyway, I'll say it again. They all went to, to Thailand and said, yeah, we're going to go to the great master Ajahn Ganda and get some real meditation teachings. So, yeah? so they went with Ajahn Brahm and the whole group. And so they, all this expenses, all this time to go to Thailand. And they kind of, now we're really going to get the real teaching. They go to Thailand and go to Ajahn Ganda and they said, Ajahn Ganda, please teach us meditation. And he says, breathe in, sabai, breathe out, sabai. <laughs> that was the end of the story. That was the whole teaching. <laughs> breathe in, relax, without relax. Uh, and uh, actually, it is a nice, it's a nice one because it is true. That's really all you have to do, right? Uh, actually, that is the whole thing. Yeah, as, if you can do it fully, actually, it will work. Yeah. So it is, <laughs> it's kind of nice. Anyway, so then uh, next one. Uh, yeah, they practice like this. I will breathe in experiencing bliss. Uh, the practice like this, I will breathe out experiencing bliss. So this is a strengthening of the previous one. Bliss is more refined than rapture. So when you have bliss, there's also more tranquility present. It's more kind of a peaceful experience. It's a more profound experience of happiness. And this happens, how does this happen? Well, it just happens by being aware of the breath and being aware of the bliss at the same time. And that awareness of the breath, as everything calms down, this is a natural outcome of that process, yeah? Things becoming more peaceful. The rapture turning into bliss. Uh, again, you don't do anything. Uh, you allow it to happen. You kind of get out of the way, as Anand Brahm expresses it. Uh, and by you getting out of the way, the process happens by itself. Uh, so you move on. Tranquility, bliss, uh, more and more peaceful as a consequence. Uh, more, more profound experiences of happiness. Uh. Isn't this a great path? Uh? Yeah, when you read this, it's like, Wow, is this true? Or is this just some kind of fantasy? Is this really true? There's a danger of reading the suttas and think that this is not real. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, whatever. I can, okay, we maybe, maybe, maybe so, whatever. Not really kind of grappling with what is going on. This is the process of breathing. This is what the breath can do to. This is like, this is real. This is not just some kind of myth or something like that. This is act actually what happens in meditation. And it was every human being has access to this. Why doesn't every human being do it? That's what I wonder. 
Shouldn't every human being be doing this? Huh? Don't you agree? Huh? Why doesn't everyone do this? this <laughs> right? Doesn't everyone want to be blissful and happy and calm and tranquil and all of these kind of things? Huh? It is there for the taking, for goodness sake. Yeah. How come everyone doesn't read down the Panasati Sutta? Obi, why is there only so many people here? We have <laughs> Next time we get the whole of Malaysia into, and they kind of... Uh, we had, to be, we had to be careful not to do something politically uh, dangerous. But, uh, <laughs> so it's true, isn't it? I, I find this teaching that so uplifting and so powerful. And it's not just here. It's like one sutta after the next one. The next sutta we're going to have a look at, which I also really love, is the sutta which also talks about the natural psychology of meditation. And psychology of meditation, again, the same kind of qualities. Yeah, the, Piti, which is the rapture, the sukha, which is happiness, the tranquility, which is the pasadi, and the joy, the pamuja at the beginning. It has just one positive thing after the other. It's like everything you ever wanted in life is right there. It's kind of extraordinary. So when you read this, remember that this is real. This is for the taking. This is possible to achieve. All you need to achieve these things is perseverance and and. Um, uh, you know, just keep on practicing and doing it, and it will happen. Uh, it's actually there. This is kind of the extraordinary thing about this. Uh, and sometimes we give up. Sometimes we think it's too hard. We come and meditate. Oh, yeah, it's always a bit dull. It's not really working. Uh, but it does work. Uh, and this is the point. The reason why it isn't working is you haven't really investigated enough. Uh, you haven't understood. You haven't committed enough to the path. Uh, you haven't tried. You haven't put in place the foundations of the path properly. But it is there for everyone. Uh, is there for you, every one of you, for me, everyone. Isn't that kind of wonderful? And you want to practice meditation? It is there for you also. That's kind of great. And so you, everyone, this is accessible for everyone. It is kind of part of the human experience. This is what it means to be human, that these things are available to you. It's too easy to just read these things and kind of see them as a word on paper and not really take it in as real personal qualities that actually are available there. Yeah, but these are real things. And when you understand what they are, it's incredibly uplifting. It's like, wow, is this really possible in the world? Is this true? Does this happen to people that just bliss out? You just sit on your seat with closed eyes and you sit there for two days without moving, completely blissed out. Is that really what possible? And it is possible. And so this is kind of the idea of understanding what actually is possible in this world what this world can give you. And once you understand that, you start to understand why contemplating the Dhamma, why it is so uplifting, how just the contemplation of the Dhamma itself leads to joy. Because you, you think, wow, this is actually available in the world. It's just amazing how lucky I am to be able to access these teachings. Accessing these teachings make these things possible. If you don't access them, it's much more tricky. Rapture, then bliss. What next? This is, this is what comes next. Uh, the practice breathing in, experiencing the mental processes. Uh, that doesn't sound so interesting, right? Mental processes. Okay, whatever. <laughs> the practice like this, I'll breathe out, experiencing mental processes. Uh, these are the chitta sankara. Now, if you know... Uh, how, what mental processes are, on the other hand, you get much more excited straight away. Huh? Because mental processes means Vedana and Sanya. It means perceptions and feelings. So basically more of the same. We're already experiencing these beautiful feelings. And now you are kind of just experiencing them again, but from a slightly different perspective, from the perspective of a mental process. So basically you are still aware yeah, of the whole mental, um, mental reality that you have. And once you are aware of that mental reality, you will see that actually it can be become more peaceful. Yeah, it is not fully peaceful yet. There may still be a little bit of movement in the mind. Maybe the rapture is still a bit too strong. There's a sense of currents and all of these kind of things. Maybe your samadhi is not fully focused on what is going on. There's a bit of movement. So then once you are aware of the mental process, then you also allow it to calm down more. Yeah, the calming down happens. That's the next one. They practice like this. I will breathe in, stilling the mental processes. They practice like this. I will breathe out, stilling the mental processes. So now the process happens again. It is still automatic. It is still just going on. 
and but it is the calming down of the whole process happening at this particular point. Uh, yeah. So again, calming down and stilling. Uh, like I was saying before, the two things that show you that you are practicing in the right were the two qualities uh, that you find always in meditation. On the one hand, the progressive stilling and calming. Yeah, stilling and calming is one of the critical aspects of of a meditation process. Uh, on the other hand, you have all the varieties of joy and happiness uh, becoming deeper and deeper and deeper, more and more profound, more and more real, more and more, have more and more meaning to them. Uh, and so you see both processes happening here, peace, joy, happiness, uh, coming together, working together in this way. Uh, these are the two things that are happening. Uh, and so this is the contemplation of feeling, the Vedana, Nupassana, according to the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah, so this is how we contemplate feelings. Uh, and um, sometimes people think that, uh, you know, contemplating feelings means contemplating pain and all of these kind of things. Yeah, oh, I'm feeling so much pain in the body. Contemplate it, stay with it, stay with the feelings. Yeah, that is kind of what people feel sometimes. Uh, and when you uh, read the Satipatthana Sutta, you could think that that is the case because in the Satipatthana Sutta, what does it say? It says that you experience the... Um, uh, the Sukha Vedana, Dukkha Vedana, the Adukama Sukha Vedana, and the feelings that are painful, happy, and neither painful nor happy. You, explain, you experience the Niramisa Sukha and the Samisa Sukha, the worldly happy feelings and the unworldly or the spiritual happy feelings. You, you experience the, uh, the uh, Dukkha, the um, Samisa Dukkha, and the Niramisa Dukkha, the worldly painful feelings and the spiritual painful feelings. Spiritual paper things? Okay, not mm, interesting. Anyway, yeah? <laughs> I'm just, uh, anyway, so from if you look at that, it looks like when we talk about worldly painful feelings, you will think, well, that means ordinary painful feelings, right? The body is painful and that kind of thing. Yeah? And yet this one here only talks about joy. Yeah? So what's going on? How can this one be the full experience of Satipatthana, of Vedana Nupasana, and yet it seems to leave out. What about those painful feelings talked about in the Satipatthana Sutta? What happened to them? So isn't something missing in the Anapanasati Sutta? Good question. Maybe something is missing. Maybe the Sutta originally was longer. Maybe there was more to it. Maybe the painful feeling disappeared. Because how can we understand painful feelings without contemplating them, right? How is that possible? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> so this is kind of one of these interesting questions. And I think once you start, you, so this is how we contemplate the Dhamma, right? We start to see, well, how does this work together? How is this possible? And the answer is actually very straightforward. It is not, there's no kind of big mystery in this at all. I'm just kind of play, playing around a little bit just to kind of make it more interesting for you. There's no, there's no big mystery here. And... Uh, uh, what is going on? Uh, yeah, what is happening here? I mean, both the Satipatthana Sutta and the Anapanasati Sutta, these are kind of universal things. Nothing has gone wrong with those suttas. They're both full and complete in their own right. Uh, so what is going on is that pain, the painful feelings of the Satipatthana Sutta, you don't have to, you don't contemplate them through their presence. Uh, you don't contemplate them when they are there, because when they are there, they are very hard to contemplate. Uh, because it's just painful, it's just unpleasant. Okay, you can see it arising or whatever, but anything which is present is always hard to contemplate, like the frog in water. The best way to contemplate painful feelings is when they're absent. And so this process we're looking at here, where we never talked about painful feelings, the reason why we can understand the painful feelings is precisely because they're absent, because they're not mentioned. Yeah, then you come to the end of the process, you think back, now you understand painful feeling. Why? Because you have moved away from the painful feelings. Now you know what they are. Before, as long as you are immersed in them, you have no perspective to really be able to understand what they are. But when you come out of them completely, that is when you can understand these things. And you can understand why they arise, because the body is also gone, like the body is part of the problem, or certain mental, uh, uh, m mental attitudes or whatever. And so this is kind of the beauty of this, yeah? And this is what I find such a, one of the powerful messages of this particular sutta. You don't have to contemplate, you don't have to experience pain to understand it. 
You don't have to sit with lots of pain in your legs and all these kind of things. The reason why sometimes these teachings are given is simply because people focus exclusively on the Satipatthana Sutta. And this is one of the biggest, one of the big problems, in my opinion, in Buddhist circles, is too much emphasis on one particular sutta, Satipatthana Sutta. But once you broaden out the scope and you look at all the suttas and you kind of join them together, you start to see things in a new way. You start to understand what is actually going on. Yeah, so this is a part of the problem here. And then you can kind of look at the Dhamma in a new way. You don't have to sit with all that pain. Find a comfortable posture. If you start to feel too uncomfortable, change your posture. Sit in a different way. Yeah, then this process becomes possible. If there's too much pain in the body, normally this process isn't even possible. Why? Because your mind is distracted by all the pain and the problems. So be comfortable. Allow the process to happen. Then experience the joy and happiness. Then come out afterwards. Then when you reflect on it, then you will understand all of these feelings of what is happening here. So this is my positive message for today. Yeah? Yeah? I have many messages for today. This is one of the positive ones. Uh, so enjoy it while it lasts. So we'll see what happens later on. Okay, let's do a little bit more meditation together here. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, any last comments or questions before we break for lunch? Yeah, just behind you, anyone here? John, just a question. Um, I need to clarify that again. When you try to clarify that, I'm not clear. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that the experiencing mental processes is a contemplation of feeling? So is it narrow? Are you saying that, because you mentioned something like mental process is Vedana and Sanya. Yeah. Is it narrow? Um, it, yeah, so the uh, Pali word is Chitta, Sankara. And Sankara means process or activity, and Chitta is mind. So mental process is a, is a good translation. Uh, uh, it is often defined in the suttas in that way. It is defined as feelings and perceptions, actually. Uh, and so that's kind of why I say that. Uh, but it could also be translated, I mean, these words are, they can have slightly different meaning depending on context. So it could also be translated as like the activities of the mind. So in other words, uh, relating to the will uh, yeah, and the activity in that sense. Uh, so then it would mean calming down the, the will, yeah, calming down the volition. Uh, it basically has the same effect, yeah, because if you calm down the perception, what you actually are calming down is the will, because the will is what makes the movements. Uh, it's the volition, the sankara, that makes the movements. So, uh, or if you calm down the, the um, will directly, if you talk about directly. So the effect is basically the same. So either way, either translation will lead to the same thing, I would say. So why is that not chitta nupasana? Why is it under vidana nupasana? Why is it not under chitta nupasana? Because it is a reference to feelings, mostly. Uh, yeah, the main it's called chitta sankara, but it is a reference. The, the reference usually in the suttas is to feelings and perceptions, so, and that's why it is there. Yeah, but I, you know, it, it is a bit random because, of course, a lot of these things do belong to the chitta in some way. But uh, when we come to the chitta, it is more, um, you know, it, it, this kind of degrees, right? And here the body is still kind of there to some extent, so it is kind of the full depth of the mind. Uh, and when we come to the really full depth of the mind, that's when the body really disappears and much more. So there are degrees of, of things. And so you have to give them slightly different names. So it is still called Chitta Sankara because it refers to those feelings. That's why it is called that, not because it is Chitta Nupasana, actually. Yeah. So you just have to know the vocabulary and the way it is used in the suttas, really. So in practice, yeah. it's still okay to just know generally, I mean, know it in a broader sense, I mean, in practice. Yeah, in practice, yeah. Okay to just... in, in, in practice, you know, you know the, the, the nice thing about this is that all of this is really an automatic process. Uh, and so the purpose of kind of putting it out and the purpose of saying it in this way is just so that you have a map of what's happening, so that you know whether you're on the right path or not. Yeah, this is kind of the purpose of this. Uh, it's not so much that you have to do anything or whatever. So you just sit back and allow it to happen to you. This is the beautiful thing about this process. It happens to you rather than you actually making it happen, yeah? So, yeah, but I find that I'm uh, really benefiting from how you're explaining because it's like when you 
meditate without this information, then yeah. it's just happening. It's just calm. It's just bliss. You know, but yeah. when you have this explanation, then I find that it gives more clarity. Yeah, yeah, it's a different perspective. Like you are right, actually. Um, before this. Uh, what I know is very much on the satipatthanas and also people's interpretation of that. You know? mm. So now hearing you have a different interpretation. So it, again, the mind is more interested. Like, hey, there can be different interpretations. Mm. The way I was looking at it may not be the only. Indeed. So yeah, good. Also, no, this is this is uh, this is good. So please, why in? Um, stealing the mental processes. The men yeah. That means something like bringing the PT back into the mind instead of letting it flow in the body and mind, right? Something like that, I would imagine. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's sort of like yeah. skipping a step, the sukha. How do you change? I mean, you allow it to just happen naturally. Yeah. Still more and more and more, right? Yeah. So I, 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 think, I, think, yeah, it is, I think the point here is that, okay, you experience the... Uh, the PT, you experience the rapture, you experience the sukha, the bliss, uh, and then you maybe you, you kind of take a little bit of a step back and you become a more overall aware of what is happening in the mind. Uh, because initially, when the bliss comes, like, well, you're so overpowering, and all you can think of is the bliss, you can't really, you have no perspective on it because it's so pleasant, it's so nice. But after a while, okay, you become more at ease with it, uh, and then you kind of get a more sense for the overall picture. Uh, and then you see, actually, it isn't quite peaceful yet. Uh, yeah, I can take it's this not further. Peaceful. Yeah? It's not peaceful. Yeah, it's not peaceful. Yeah, so depending on depending on the depth of the meditation, it will not be entirely peaceful. So then you you become aware of the whole picture of things, uh, and then you say, okay, I need to calm it down more. Uh, yeah, and so then because you know it should be calmed down more, that knowledge uh, is then often enough yeah, for the mind automatically to allow that to happen. Uh, yeah. Okay. One more thing is, what if there's pain and pity happening together? Can you make use of that moment? Pain and pity happening together. Yeah. So what you're saying is that the body is kind of a little bit in the background. There's some pain in the body, and, and uh, there's pity causing pity causing through the body, and there's pain. Yeah. So that's okay. Um, I, in that case, you just have to focus on the pity. Yeah. Stay with the pity, and then uh, allow wh whatever remnant there is of pain. There won't be much pain left at that point. Maybe a little bit, but uh, mm, no, it was almost equal. But somebody was telling me to go back to breath. Back to the breath. Uh, yeah. Go back. One more step up. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, so <laughs> okay. Uh, usually, when the PT becomes quite strong, there isn't much much pain usually in the body. Yeah. But uh, so maybe you have some kind of special special experience. Uh, uh, yeah. Stay stay with the breath. Uh, that's kind of that, that's the main object throughout all of this because that gives you a kind of stability when things are changing. So you have something to hold on to in a sense. Uh, uh, and then just also stay with the breath and the PT. I mean, these things experience are there at the same time, pretty much, you know. You can't really avoid feeling the PT as well if it is there. Stay with the breath, uh, allow it to go deeper. And as you go deeper, the body will disappear even more. Huh? But if there is some serious problems in the body, then gently adjust the body posture as well. Huh? You know, do something else. Uh, if it is a physical pain, uh, try to kind of move the body a little bit. Because if it is anything that is... Um, intruding on the meditation is obviously going to make it difficult to advance more. So you want to kind of avoid those, uh, those things to intrude too much. Uh, so you just have to experiment a bit, see what happens. Uh, yeah. yeah. We're running out of time. Yeah. 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 Just, uh, one slight one. Um, yeah. The instruction in the beginning is uh, breathing in heavy. I know we know they're breathing in heavy, then breathing in light, they know. Yeah. They know. So that subsequently is always they practice like this. Yeah. Is there a difference? Um, I think the difference is that uh, you know, because once mindfulness is established, uh, then it is automatic, you know, yeah, because mindfulness is already there. You don't have to do anything more. Whereas the feeling the whole body, it takes some time before the mindfulness is strong enough. So you need to practice for a while before actually you're able to do that. Uh, so, so the difference is they, when you say they practice like this, it's more about just knowing, but it's, it's, it's just... It takes time before you get there. So practice means that you have to stay with the breath. It doesn't mean that you do anything in particular. It just means that you have to stay with the breath for a while. And then when you do that for a while, then this is the outcome. Whereas the long and short breath, that's kind of immediate. Yeah, As long as mindfulness is established, okay, you can do that straight away because mindfulness is there. Whereas the other thing takes... Takes takes a while, so you have to keep on going, practicing. In other words, uh, yeah.
Okay, everyone. So let's have a have some lunch, and I will see you back in at two o'clock. Yeah.